I'm delighted to introduce uh, Richard Rogers. Richard is a university professor of new media and digital culture at UFA, the University of Amsterdam. And he is also the uh, director of uh, govcom.org and the Digital Methods Initiative. Uh, Richard is going to talk with us today about, largely about his new book that's coming out with MIT Press titled Digital Methods. So, Thanks very much. I'm, I'm really um, pleased to be here in such august company. Um, the title is The End of the Virtual. Um, and what I'm going to do is talk about um, digital methods. It's a, it's a term that I coined in, in 2007 to try to capture a shift, or what I saw as a shift at the time, um, in internet-related research. And I'm gonna, hit, I'm gonna sort of first um, historicize or contextualize digital methods uh, in, the, in a sort of light periodization of internet research. Um, then I'm gonna talk a little bit about, very, very briefly, about um, a couple of contemporary debates within, mainly within science and technology studies, but within, um, um, science technology studies related to method, about the difference between digital method and digitized method or virtual methods. And then finally, I'm going to introduce you to some um, <clears throat> digital methods, the approaches, uh, which are both art-based and, and in the empirical tradition. Um, I'd like to sort of periodize internet-related research into, into three periods, uh, generally speaking. Um, and this is all post-cybernetics. This is beginning basically with the web. Um, so in the early days, you, what we had uh, were quite a lot of uh, claims about the transformative properties of, of the web, of cyberspace, uh, how it would impact the body, corporality, identity, politics. Um, and what was quite interesting about it was, uh, of course, that the, the online was oftentimes considered a sort of separate space or separate realm. Um, now, sometime about, I mean, I dated it about 1998, others a little bit later, um, the social scientists, in some sense, arrived. And the social scientists um, came in with a quite a typical social scientific and in instrumentarian apparatus um, and debunked a lot of the early claims about cyberspace, about <clears throat> um, how it would transform identity, how it would transform politics, how it would transform uh, corporality. But what was interesting about the social scientists arriving, and particularly the ethnographers. I, I mean, Steve Jones, volume from 1998, doing internet research. Um, Slater and Miller, 1999. Um, Christine Hine, um, the, the, ethno the ethnographers largely. Um, what, what they basically did was they moved offline. So they went to cyber cafes, uh, etc., cetera, um, and, and you know, just debunked some of the earlier claims, coming up with notions of the digital divide, etc. Um, but they went offline. Um, and they went offline and they studied users. And that tradition of studying users, at least in the social sciences and internet related research, um, continues on uh, uh, till today. Um, now, something um, for me uh, happened somewhere around 2007. I mean, for all of us in this room, I think um, um, maybe it was around this time as well, maybe far earlier, maybe you were way ahead, um, where suddenly um, the web or web-related research, internet-related research, started to think of the web very, very differently as uh, not necessarily a, a realm of part or not necessarily something to be studied on the ground, but rather um, as a data set. Um, and <clears throat> and what's, what's interesting about this sort of data turn uh, of, of web-related research um, is the question of where the baseline is now um, and whether or not you can make claims about um, what's happening in society, what's happening in culture more generally, using web data. Um, and, and this is what I'd like to explore with you uh, today. So to what extent can we use web data um, to ground our claims? Um, so can we ground our claims about what's happening in society and culture in the online? Now for me, the turning point was sometime in 2007 um, when, this was a newspaper article, it was investigative reporting in the Netherlands. The, the research question was, is Dutch culture hardening? Is Dutch culture hardening? And <clears throat> so there was basically the study of the sort of rise of extremism, rise of hate. Um, and 
um, what, the, what the journalist researchers did uh, was not embed themselves, um, was not interview experts, was not go to the Social History Institute and look at pamphlets, uh, but rather uh, they went to the Wayback Machine uh, of the Internet Archive and they made a sort of quite traditional sort of spreadsheet um, and they um, looked up things like stormfront.nl, uh, about a hundred different um, extremist sites and right-wing sites. So right, right-wing and right-wing extremists. It's sort of maybe it's a European distinction <laughs> because you travel very well. But anyway, um, and, they, and, they, and they looked at the evolution of language of both of these types of websites. And what they found was that the right-wing websites were increasingly, the language on them was increasingly looking like the extremist websites. And so they then cautiously concluded that the Dutch, that Dutch culture is hardening. They grounded their claims in the online, which is quite sort of radical uh, in some sense. Or when I read that newspaper article, I was shocked. Now, for a lot of us, this is sort of normal. Um, there are people in this room, I think, who are co-authors of, of this article. Uh, you know, yeah. Um, of the, the famous computational uh, social science article in Science in 2000. Where, where, the, where the web was heralded really for the first time uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a data set. Now, um, in social science circles in particular, um, this was kind of shocking um, because of a number of reasons. I mean, the first one is, is the historical reason of the, of the web, the trustworthiness of the web generally. Uh, so the web is always, was always considered to be rumor mills, Side of conspiracy theory, pirates, pornographers, but largely a realm of self-publication, um, and and so so web data in and of itself was considered uh, quite dubious. Um, this is a quote from um, quite a well-known sort of web matrician in, in, in Europe, maybe also here, Mike Thelwall. I mean, he argued sort of three points. I mean, against web data, um, largely saying you know it's it's terribly messy. Um, and, um, and it has reputational issues. But if you're going to use it, um, make sure that you ground your claims, whatever claims you make, that you then further ground them or triangulate or whatever uh, in, um, in, the, in the offline. So the baseline must remain the offline. Why? Um, well, I mean, this is sort of quite a sort of standard um, some ideas about what good data. I mean, the web oftentimes fails spectacularly according to the ideas of good data. Um, it's, you can't, it's, I mean, search engine query logs, um, tagging, it, it's quite messy, it's difficult to collect over long periods of time. I mean, that's, I, I would imagine that's why we're embracing Twitter quite a lot um, and, and we're increasingly embracing the APIs, but prior to Twitter, um, uh, it was, web data was considered not very good data. Um, this was, to me, it was an extremely important project, uh, Google Flu Trends. Um, uh, this is a Google.org project, as you know. So looking at the locations of flu and flu-related queries uh, and then plotting them uh, to a map. Um, what was interesting about it was that um, the Google Flu Trends data, they were sort of seven days ahead. Um, of the typical surveillance uh, techniques of the, of the CDC and, and other um, national authorities, so seven days ahead. Um, but they still grounded their findings in the CDC data. So whilst we may be ahead, we, we, we have to make sure that our trends are, are like their trends. Um, <clears throat> I want to talk uh, about sort of slowly move into the idea of, of grounding um, data uh, or grounding findings in the online. But before doing so, to just make a couple of observations or make a kind of like an ontological, epistemological distinction between two kinds of methods um, for, with respect to internet-related research. One is some digitized methods <coughs> or virtual methods. Um, I've had a, a number of people ask me, well, I've made a survey um, now, where do I send it? To which discussion lists? So we have some, quite a few difficulties, or quite, quite a few sort of, um, um, so, yeah, kind of growing pains. Uh, so digit, so taking our kind of standard social scientific methods and, and just digitizing, importing them onto the web. Um, 
because we oftentimes don't know the population, it's very difficult to sample, or... Um, one of the things that I find interesting about um, uh, uh, this last one um, is um, how we use the web to fact check. So it used to be that um, we might we'll look something up on the web, prepare for an interview, go and then interview someone, and that was the truth. Uh, but now the sort of order of fact checking is, is kind of changing, arguably, for a lot of, a lot of journalists. So, so we, we interview, and then we check the web. So what's different? Well, what's the digital methods uh, program? Um, well, what I'm trying to put forward is, is the idea of kind of thinking a little bit differently about how to do research with the internet or on the internet. Um, and I want to make that distinction between methods that are kind of, I don't know, written for the medium or embedded in the medium and those that have been migrated to it or, vir or digitized or virtual. So make a distinction between the digitized and the natively digital or the digital. Um, and so what I try to do in my work with a group of researchers in Amsterdam is, is to try to think through how we can use existing online method. Um, so these are the steps. So, and these are so different from some software projects. So um, ask yourself the question, okay, what kind of objects uh, are available online? Tags, Wikipedia edits, timestamps, etc. What, what, what objects are available? And then the question is, how do the dominant devices use them? So how do search engines uh, use links, time stuff, etc.? And then the, the move for the social scientists, for me at least, um, is how do we repurpose um, that method for social research? So how do, we, um, how do we repurpose a search engine? How do we repurpose Wikipedia? How do we repurpose? Um, and then ultimately ask the question, uh, how to ground these findings? Can we ground these findings in the online? Uh, radically. Um, if we make findings with online data, do we always have to go offline? Or can we ground them in further online data? Um, and I just want to emphasize when I say natively digital, I don't mean sort of anthropological or anthropographic. What I mean is uh, are, um, methods uh, written for the medium, uh, objects written for the medium, so a blog, web native thing. Now, one of the, the examples that struck me, and this was in the New York Times, I think two years ago, um, these are um, the results of queries at allrecipe.com uh, day before Thanksgiving, two, 2009. And the darker, the purple, the higher the incidence of, uh, of the queries. And so, so here's the query, macaroni and cheese, which not necessarily a Thanksgiving dish, uh, at least for a um, has a sort of subtle, <laughs> Sweet potato, corn casserole, kind of in the corn box. Green beans, turkey brine, it's up in your neighborhood. Uh, yams, apparently. Is, uh... So, what you get is a sort of kind of distributed geography of taste on the basis of, of, of query logs, um, which um, Arguably, it would be kind of difficult to, I mean, you could, you could do this sort of work in, with other means, uh, but it might not be fundable, could be quite expensive, could be quite burdensome. Um, and then the question is, well, how do you, how do you, how do you ground this? Um, do you then ground it with sort of, I don't know, Flickr photos of Thanksgiving dinner? And stuff? Can you also ground it further online? Or do we have to do surveys? And these are questions. Okay, so um, what I want to do, um, briefly is, is take you through what we've been developing in terms of digital methods, um, a, a number of, number of examples. Um, and and the, the, the work that we do, we, we do it from, on, I don't know, so from the micro to the macro, from the small uh, atoms to the, to the large masses. So the, the, so the question is, so how do you work with natively digital objects? How do you study links, tags, Wikipedia, et cetera? Uh, how do you study websites? Uh, what is the sort of digital methods approach to, to, to websites? Um, the ones that have the little sort of uh, notation before, and I'll talk about those in detail. So, so for, for example, I won't talk about the website in detail. Um, but what we do is we, um, we use the Wayback Machine of, of the Internet Archive um, and um, uh, capture um, the history of a website and make it into a movie, into a sort of screencast documentary like time-lapse photography showing the changes over time 
uh, to a particular website. Uh, <clears throat> engines, how do you study engines? Uh, the spheres, the blogosphere, um, other spheres, the web sphere, uh, new sphere, tagosphere, uh, the webs, how do you, or the web, how do you study the web, and the World Wide Web in general? Uh, how do you study Wikipedia? Um, social networking sites, and then uh, finally uh, Twitter. So I'll cover uh, I'll, I'll cover some of these. And, and the way I'm going to introduce it is is to talk a little bit about how they're often studied, and then what a digital methods approach uh, would look like. Um, so the link, how are links often studied? I mean, links are often studied from sort of hypertext theory uh, idea of the idea of of a, of a surfer uh, <coughs> authoring a path through the web, authoring one's own story. Um, small worlds of path theory, um, the, the, the idea um, that, the, that there's a sort of distance, number of clicks between uh, two people, or social network analysis, which a lot of people uh, know, more about positioning, uh, the extent to which one is central or highly in between in a, in, a, in a network. But how would a digital method sort of think about this? Um, well, the idea is that you follow um, uh, the dominant devices, think about how they treat natively digital objects, and see if you can repurpose that uh, for social research. Um, so think of Google, how does Google treat links? Uh, the largest is reputation markers, uh, relevance indicators. So what we do um, is we look at how um, sites link to one another. And we look into um, links as sort of relevance indicators. And when we look into the, sort of the politics of association, so who links to whom? Um, and in this particular picture, what you see before you is, um, uh, this is a classic one from some time ago, you see a corporation linking to Greenpeace and Greenpeace not linking back. You see Greenpeace linking and the corporation linking to government and government not linking back. You see very, very typical politics of association. Um, what you see before you, and Lance showed one of these uh, last night, is a piece of software we built it's called the Issue Crawler. Uh, what the issue caller does is it, it, it sort of renders these politics, these micro-politics of association. Um, and what you see here are sort of nodes and lines. Um, but what we mapped is, um, is the Armenian NGO space. Um, and what you see, uh, the Armenian NGOs are largely in blue and, and red. And, uh, and you see the UN organizations largely in the World Bank, the intergovernmental organizations in uh, yellow. Um, what you see largely is the Armenians linking amongst themselves and to their funders, let's say, and their funders linking amongst themselves and not linking back. Okay, so this is a classic case of, of what I call aspirational linking. Uh, and this is another example. This is a project that we did uh, with Citizen Lab at the University of Toronto where we mapped um, Palestinian space. We mapped the networks of uh, Hamas and Fatah. Uh, Fatah on uh, your left, and Hamas on the right. And what you see is the Fatah network. It's quite a sort of civic web uh, newspapers, uh, local organizations. And the Fatah network uh, looks rather, uh, just links to RSS feeds and RSS readers. So it looks like a very, very underground uh, organization. Um, this sort of link analysis we've, uh, we've applied, um, I call it dynamic URL sim, uh, sampling. We've applied it to uh, internet censorship research with the, uh, with the Open Net Initiative at the Berkman Center of, uh, at the uh, University of Toronto. Um, and what, um, uh, what, how that work is normally done is they make a sort of manual list of URLs on certain subject matters, then they run them through proxies or through machines on the ground in different countries. So what I did is I took their manually created list of uh, sort of Iranian uh, political, the, the one category is called social, political, and religious sites, and I ran them through the issue crawler, and then I subsequently um, ran the, the, the sites through um, an in, in, uh, internet censorship uh, ex, uh, exploration tool that we also have. I'll show you all the tools at the end of this talk. Um, Richard, did you use a snapshot of a particular type of Wayback Machine, or is that an application of the ordering of connected? Do you take snapshot? The way that we should they typically do sample about 15, 20 percent every month or two months. So I have another diagram like that before. Could you go back to the previous political one? I'm just curious, is that the, the, the Palestinian one? 
Yeah, yeah. Hamas versus. Yeah, yeah. yeah Hamas, yes. Yeah, this has nothing to do with the way back and show. Also, this one is a current status. Yeah. Now. But I, I, I mean, I have, histor I have historical link maps from the Wayback Machine, by the way. I'm not going to show them today. Yeah. I'm just curious how we use the Wayback Machine because the data is subset every two months and the link are sparser, so it makes it more difficult to create more complete picture like the dense diagram that you're showing here, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I mean, I mapped the early blogosphere. You, you, can, you can do some stuff with the. I mapped the early blogosphere with the Wayback Machine. So in any case, what you see here um, is, um, so we took the seed URLs from, from, the, from the Open Ed Initiative, we crawled them, we found, the out, uh, we found their outlinks, uh, we ran a co-link analysis, we rendered it um, as, a, as a spring map, and what you see in red are the block sites, in blue the unblocked sites, and the red ones with the yellow pins are newly discovered blocked sites. So we discovered uh, we discovered new, 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 new block sites on the basis of this sort of dynamic URL sample. It's a means of finding related sites. Um, and this is double-edged. I mean, this is the only one we published. Because uh, these are good for sensors. You know, so, oh, the blue ones. So this is, a, th this is the tool we use. Uh, this one particular instance, the, the, the Citizen Lab at the University of Toronto, they have the BBC on their list as a site to be checked, um, and our link map, which is, runs on a page level, turned, turned up the relevant page to be bbc.co.uk slash Persian, the Persian language BBC news site. Um, and you notice that the regular BBC uh, gets an uh, OK response code, and the, and the Persian language one is blocked in the wrong. So we found, uh, also on a page level, uh, blocked. Okay, how do you study engines, search engines? Um, in, in, in the media in particular, um, there's a lot of search engine critique. Um, oftentimes, the, a lot of the critique comes from this sort of these 1990, uh, early, these 1990s, these early studies about the dark web um, and, and the idea that search engines are, are actually exclusionary uh, mechanisms, um, burying sites low down in the rankings, not indexing the entire web. I mean, not that I agree with this particular, not in, in indexing the entire web. So engines to, uh, for some uh, people, encourage attention deficits. Um, um, the Nicholas Carr's uh, work in, in this respect, um, where he wrote that, that uh, search engines are sort of uh, making a flickering man, uh, replacing uh, contemplative man. Or human. Um, the, the other critique, and this is, there'll be a, that, that's the keynote uh, speaker at the Web Science, uh, Siva. Um, how do you pronounce his last name? Vaini Nathan. Vaini, okay. Vaini Nathan. Vaini Nathan, yeah. Um, is uh, well known for, his, for, uh, for the Googleization critique. I mean, seeing Google as a, as a hegemon, as a monolith, um, as uh, creeping from, uh, from one industry into, into another. Um, of course, the surveillance studies, um, the, the, I mean, with the release of the AOL data in 2006, where we saw for the first time um, sort of sets of people's search engine queries and how shocking they were um, to see uh, how intimate um, a set of search engine uh, queries, and a user's search engine queries. So, the, the, so the, the, the rise of a kind of new data body uh, beyond your medical records, beyond your governmental records. Now you have these other records. Um, so how do we study engines? Uh, we do it in two ways, or three, or two ways we'll talk about. Uh, the first is sort of engine diagnostics. Um, we save search engine returns. Um, we've been saving a bunch of them for a number of years. Uh, we've saved search engine returns for the query 911 uh, since about 2007. Um, and what you see before you is a depiction. This was more of an art project. We also do science with this. But this is uh, a depiction of a piece of software we built called the Issue Dramaturg. And the Issue Dramaturg uh, tries to capture the drama of search engine space. Um, and just as this tool was, was launching sort of a few years ago, um, it captured drama. So what you see before you is the page rank of three websites for the query 911. Um, and you see. In red, this is an inverted graph. So remember, so that if you're if you're at the top of the returns, you're at the top of the graph by one. Um, so, so um, 
9-11 truth.org routinely returned in the top, uh, top five for the query 9-11. Uh, the New York Times, which is in blue, comes in around 50. NYC government, uh, which is in green, comes in at about 120. Um, and these things are relatively stable. And then, and then suddenly on the 17th of September, this was 2007, 9-11 um, truth.org precipitously drops. It drops from uh, uh, rank five to uh, 200, then out of the out of the results altogether. And um, apart from some court court cases, this is one of the. I mean, I don't know how, what, what kind of data is in this room, but uh, from as far as I know, this is one of the a few documented cases of the apparent removal of a of a website uh, by Google or um, a sort of automated uh, uh, page rank uh, uh, decline. Uh, it came back about uh, sort of 18 days later. What's, what's interesting about this is it raises questions about the sort of stability and volatility of, of engine results uh, generally. And, and uh, our, 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 we're working on this uh, uh, at the moment uh, on those sorts of questions. But more importantly, um, doing social research, so not engine diagnostics, but how do you do social research uh, with engines? Uh, so we built a tool. It's called the Lipmanian device, uh, named after Walter Lippmann. Um, uh, where we do, uh, we try to do, we use a search engine to do research. So search as research, and this always troubles a lot of people because teachers often say, "Look, stop to tell their students, don't Google," um, and we're sort of encouraging them to Google. Uh, so, how do we do search as research? Well, first of all, we've developed a research browser. So this is like a notebook for field work, but if you're doing online work, we work with a research browser, separate instance of, of Firefox, uh, whereby you're signed out of everything, disentangled uh, from, from, uh, from, uh, from, from Google. Um, so you're, 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 you're not, you, your history's off, um, you're, uh, you're out of social networks. Um, you use um, the no country redirect of Google, so you get the sort of google.com, uh, so you don't get the geographical. Um, or you can use Google, so you get sort of as, as universal of the results uh, from Google as, as possible. I mean, I just want to show you this, uh, this tool very, very briefly, how it works. Um, so uh, what this tool does is it, uh, uh, it queries uh, Google, and it looks for the number of times a particular organization mentions a particular term, a particular issue. And I'll just give you an example. Uh, this is public knowledge, you'll probably have heard of it, digital rights advocacy organization. Like most NGO websites, they organize, um, is well organized in, in terms of how to research them. They have issues, there's always an issues tab. Here's the first part of it, here's the second part of it. So what we're doing is we're looking for um, the extent to which uh, public knowledge um, uh, mentions each of these issues on their, on their website. So this. This, this tool batch queries Google, and so you see the distribution of um, public knowledge's issue, how many mentions they have on their own website. So they look like they do all their issues the same, but there's actually a distribution. <coughs> I just want to show you, we did this sort of on a much larger scale, uh, researching the climate change skeptics. Um, so our question was, uh, which organizations mention the skeptics by name? Can we, can we, can we make a tool where you could have a kind of partisanship detector, kind of bias detector, kind of issue commitment uh, detector. I mean, so this is uh, a query of the top 75 uh, climate change sites on the web, and then which ones name the skeptics by name. So this is Saudi Arabia, Timothy Bowen. I mean, this was kind of interesting that climate science mentioned the skeptics by name. So this is a tool um, that's uh, available for use so if you do uh, resonance analysis, partisanship analysis. The web. How is the web studied in general? Um, it's of, oftentimes studied in the, in the, in the, in the singular. Um, as it talked about before, it's often studied as, as sort of yeah, a cyberspace is round part, um, also as an infrastructure. Um, 
it's oftentimes there's a debate between increasingly now between whether whether the web is is um, organized more by language uh, or by sort of geographical borders, uh, sort of the national versus uh, language web uh, uh, debates. Um, um, we we have sort of um, started what we call national web studies. Um, and it has to do uh, largely with um, this kind of technical infrastructural change, quite fundamental in the web, um, which started, I think, around 2000, 2002, uh, with the uh, Yahoo law lawsuit that Goldsmith uh, and Wu wrote about, um, where um, these French NGOs sued Yahoo um, because in France you could see um, sort of Nazi memorabilia pages on Yahoo. Um, which was illegal to, to view that sort of material in France. Um, so, so Yahoo was sued. Ultimately, what came out of it was GeoIP. Um, so, so detecting the location of the browser user. And then, uh, so when you type in, if you're in, if you're in France, you type in google.com, you get google.fr, you're sort of sent home by default. Um, this is my, one of my favorite artworks. It sort of captures this, uh, this sort of GeoIP. It's by Paul Mutanz, a Budapest uh, based artist. Um, so we um, study um, uh, national webs. Um, and in particular, um, we uh, study their health. And, and, and I want to just contextualize this very, very briefly. We started studying national webs in 2007. Um, we were hearing a lot of reports of, about what was happening in Iraq. Um, from fact-finding missions, from authentic voices on the ground, bloggers, um, from the news, and, and there were conflicting reports. So we thought to ourselves, well, what can we find out about what's happening on, on the ground in Iraq from its web? So we grabbed the Iraqi web, uh, which was quite small at the time. Um, uh, the leading ministries, the leading <coughs> companies, the educational institutions, etc. We found a broken web. We found university websites down or poached. Uh, we found uh, all, most cultural institutions also down. Um, we found a broken web overall, except for one website, and that was the Ministry of Oil. <laughs> it was flourishing. Um, it was the only website that also had a banner on it. Um, so what we thought to ourselves was, well, we could actually sort of begin to think about metrics uh, for studying the health of a, of a, of a country. Uh, or it's through its web, or, or, or at least the health of its web. Um, and, and, and so, um, so we've, we've devised a number of approaches to sort of demarcate. So how do you sort of get a national web? Um, do you do it with IP ranges? Um, I would say no. Um, do you do it um, through crawling? I would also say no. What we do is, is we demarcate national webs through sort of what we call dominant devices online, device cultures. Um, so um, we use a series of devices that purport to uh, output the top sites in a particular country. Um, and then we concatenate those sites, um, and then we study their, their health. Um, we also built this uh, simple tool that, that, for example, grabs a, uh, a country uh, level domain. So how do we, what are the metrics? for diagnosing the, the, the health of a, of a national web. Um, we look, uh, uh, we run a number of metrics. Um, we look for the freshness of the sites, so the youthfulness of them. We look at the, the brokenness of sites, so we use link validators. Um, we look for responsiveness, whether the, the sites are actually up. Um, we look for datedness, uh, uh, what software versions are running. We also look for dated users, the browser versions of the users. Um, so we did this very, very recently for Iran. Uh, so we did a sort of full-fledged study of, of, um, of the Iranian web. Um, this was um, uh, with the Iran media program at, uh, uh, at the Annenberg School of Communication, University of Pennsylvania. Um, and, and, and we applied this method, of, this sort of new method of how to demarcate a national web using um, what we call device cultures. Uh, so we used Google Ad Planner, uh, we used Alexa, we used Google Web Search, and then we used uh, three uh, um, uh, popular uh, web 
yeah, recommender systems uh, in Iran, so Lycor, which is for blogs, uh, Dombala and Sablin and, and Balatrin, which is for so all kinds of sites. Um, and, and what you see uh, before you is, is a sort of pie chart, sorry about that, uh, uh, but, but, the, but the, the yellow um, means that they're responsive. So the Iranian web is remarkably responsive. From outside? Uh, fr from, from, uh, from outside, yeah. Uh, it's remarkably responsive. And, it's, um, and it, at the same time, it's uh, uh, roundly blocked. So, so the bloggers web in particular, something like 95% of the, of the websites in our sample, which is a sample of uh, about 2,800 uh, websites in the, in the bloggers web, so to speak, the blogs, 95% uh, of blogs. So, so it's, a, it's extremely responsive web, uh, yet it's blocked. So it's blocked, yet blogging. Right? So which, what it suggests is a sort of widespread internet mm -hmm. censorship circumvention culture. On the blocked web in Iran, how do you reconcile that with John Kelly's findings so that it wasn't anything close to 95% blocked? Remember that paper that came out of Berkman five, six years ago? They, they looked, and, and even if you look at sites that originate outside of Iran, the, the level of blockage wasn't nearly as high as 95%. So how do you, I mean, so there's a web methods question. I mean, they apparently had a method that differed in result from your methods, so. Um, well, their study came up before the Green Revolution. So you think that this is a historical change? Yeah. So you, you found a historical change? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so it's, it's, uh, the, the, the Iranian web is increasing in the block. More and more and more. Uh, and I mean, and, the, and the, the number of sort of blacklisted keywords is sort of increasing. I mean, there's, there's much more to this study. Uh, so this is what it looks like. This came out. February um, 2012, um, it's online, you can find it. Um, and I mean, there's much, much more to it. We also, in this study, we, we, um, we did, we did a, an analysis of all, of, 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 of all kinds of sort of words which, would, which either you would definitely get blocked if you use them, um, that if you use them, you were definitely taking sides uh, or if you use them, you were writing in code, in coded language. So three types of three types of terms in Persian, um, and we uh, found that all of the usage of these those sorts of terms. So so the terms, if you use it, you're definitely going to get blocked. If you if you use it, you're definitely taking sides, the wrong side. Um, all that term usage we also found was increasing. So there's the, the more and more sites are being blocked. The language is becoming fi fierier and fierier. Um, and the and the and the, uh, the uh, internet censorship circumvention is to grow. That is the state of the Iranian web, as far as we found. Okay. Uh, so I'll just very briefly uh, give you um, uh, a kind of conclude or, or talk about how we study Wikipedia. Um, oftentimes, Wikipedia is studied as an encyclopedia. Um, uh, the extent to which it's encyclopedia-like, uh, it's as good as Britannica, things like this. Um, increasingly, Wikipedia study is a bureaucracy. It's very interesting. A lot of very interesting work. It's a very well-functioning bureaucracy. Why is that? It mitigates conflict very well, etc. Um, the third way is its relationship with Google. Oftentimes, the, the head of Encyclopedia Britannica called Wikipedia's relationship with Google is symbiotic. Um, so, how do we study it? Um, we study it as a cultural reference, not as a reference. But as a cultural reference, and, and we compare the same Wikipedia article across uh, different languages. And I just want to give you one example. This is uh, Sh uh, Srebrenica, Srebrenica, say in the Netherlands. Um, and we did a comparison of uh, the content of the English, the Dutch, the Serbo Croatian, the Bosnian, the Serbian, and the Croatian um, uh, Srebrenica articles. And the first thing you'll notice is they have different names. The Dutch one uses the military name, the fall, um, the Serbo Croatian, the Serbian, and the English use massacre, and the Bosnians uh, use, and the Croatians use genocide. And we uh, won't go into how we do it. Um, we do a sort of form of kind of web content analysis, uh, which is also medium specific. Um, so we use also 
you know, the anonymous edits, etc., etc. But I just want to show you the, the cultural difference. So what, what you're studying when you study this in terms of the, the sort of the fine grain, the deep content. Um, these are the victim counts. Uh, you see that they're quite different. The Serbs, uh, uh, the, the, Bos well, the Bosnian Serbs were the ones uh, who committed the massacre or the genocide. Uh, so the Serbs tend to round down. The Dutch, whose forces were on the ground, also tend to round down the victim counts, uh, whereas the other countries are this is very, very specific in the other countries to tend to round up. Um, we also do image analysis, so what are the different images? It's interesting because the Bosnian, so the Serbian um, images on, on, the, on, on the Wikipedia articles, the Serbian ones um, are very sort of minimal, whereas the, whereas the Bosnian ones are largely uh, focus a lot on uh, children. Sort of indicating basically the, the, the argument for the genocide. So that this, the Serbs killed kids, not just soldiers. Uh, so this is going to be presented at the Wikipedia conference in Berlin uh, in April. So I won't, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just tell you briefly how we study social media uh, as, by way of conclusion. Um, this is more of an art project. Um, uh, it's called Alfredo. We built this for lazy social media people. So uh, uh, you're too lazy to build a profile. So, you, so that's you can click this button, fill me in, and you in, insert one interest, and, and it, it generates a profile for you on the basis of actual data. Uh, so it's, it sits on top of MySpace queries, uh, MySpace for that for that interest, um, and then. And then, and then we sort of compile a, 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 a profile on the basis of that. But, but it's, not, it's not sort of 100% compatibility. It's, it's about sort of 62%. We looked into what makes friends, um, what kind of compatibility measures are positive for friends. And we found this figure of 62% in it. So it uses that. There's other features. Uh, you can get a profile makeover. Um, and so, and so you can, I mean, we were using this for a bunch of things, but we, we, uh, we wanted to look at the difference. We developed a term um, which we call post-demographics. I won't get into it, but we we um, we queried uh, Obama's friends and McCain's friends uh, just uh, prior to the last year's presidential election. We're doing this for the upcoming presidential election. I just want to tell you the difference between Obama's friends, what they like to watch on TV, um, uh, The Daily Show, The Lost, and The Heroes, and the and McCain's friends, they like Family Guy, Project Runway, America's Next Top Model, Desperate Housewives. <laughs> uh, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Richard. We have about 15 minutes for questions and discussions. Who would like to pick it up? Yes, ma'am. I guess this is a discussion that both addresses your really great talk and, and, and our whole enterprise here, which is um, how do you convince standard social science to do this stuff in a serious way, as opposed to inventing impromptu attitudes about the web that then, then drive their entire use of it in research? So I can tell you about a project in Sweden that I'm trying to advise a bit. Um, and their attitude is that links are meaningless, and they, 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 can't, they, they can't get a grip on links, and that's pretty fundamental. And then there's a project in Germany that is involving looking at content spillovers, taking the print media as the gold standard for public spheres. And, and I'm, I'm having, a, you know, there's a hundred more creative ways of approaching that question of the public sphere. But it's a divide, it's the online, it's the offline, it's looking for spillover, and I'm going crazy. So um, what, what do we do to expand the influence of our studies in social science more generally? Um, well, I, um, my, my view is that, um, we heard that, so Richard was talking about um, whether or not there needs to be a baseline. And you know, my, my view is for social scientists to engage with, say, digital trace data seriously, there has to be, um, like, well, Dimitri Williams has used the term mapping um, between virtual worlds and the, the, off, the offline world. Um, 
Ron Furt in a paper on his paper on second life, he uses the term construct validity, and it's the idea that the behaviour that's um, being studied in the virtual space has some mapping or uh, it, it, it resembles offline behaviours in some way. Otherwise, you're just studying an online. Well, I won't say just. Otherwise, you're studying an, an online culture, right. and and that's that, that's fine. But it's not what social scientists typically do. So I I actually think that. It, there either have to be atoms being moved, to use the terms from yesterday, you know, bits versus atoms. You know, if atoms are being moved, then, then that makes it interesting to social scientists, regardless of the behaviour. But if the atoms are not being moved, then, then there has to be some sort of mapping between the online behaviour and behaviours that social scientists are familiar with and have been studying with. Yeah, but I, I think a, a social scientists often uh, think about reality as filtered through paradigms, and, and the paradigm is the thing. And so, I, I mean, may, and maybe that's the end of the discussion until paradigms break down and the web becomes aha moments for more social scientists that we're kind of stuck. But I would like this kind of network to become much more persuasive in helping people rethink uh, the, the social sphere as, you know, inclusive of the, the web spheres. Yep. I was really interested in your distinction between the art projects and the science projects. And it, it, I wondered if you've seen opportunities or even some uses of your more artful devices put towards scientific ends, creating a little bit of a feedback loop within the method you described. Yeah. So, um, so I mean, uh, uh, the, the so the, a lot of the a lot of the the art the artwork um, comes. Uh, are sort of I don't know proof of concept of, of social science, yeah. uh, or or try to be. Um, uh, so I mean the, the, the so the, the issue dramaturg is something that's that um, has been around since since two thousand seven, um, and it is a it yeah as as the name indicates it you know I was kind of being a little bit tongue in cheek saying that I wanted to capture drama in search engine space, but I'm actually quite serious. Uh, because in search engine space, there are these precipitous rises and precipitous falls, um, and and um, the work that I've done on it uh, describes that space as, and I'm not the only one who's done work on this, as a, as a kind of hyperlink economy, um, and and um, and so this was one way to demonstrate to quite a like a larger audience sort of this idea, um, which which uh, I've later written about in essays, but then in terms of empirical social science work. Um, that's come later because we have saved um, search engine results for uh, six years, um, and so we can see, um, you know, quite significant uh, um, volatility in uh, in search engine results, which is which is uh, which is something that is um, uh, counter to a lot of the, the claims that are made about the stability of, uh, of engine results at the time. So um, there's um, there's a pinker in that. Yeah. And, and this one, um, this one got some attention. Uh, this is El Frendo, so, so the slogan is um, taking the work out of social networking. Um, and this was also a kind of proof of concept. So we're trying to think through, um, so when you, when you study social media, I mean, there's a lot of ways to study it, but what, one of the things, if you think of it from a medium specific point of view, from a visual <coughs> methods point of view, what so what sort of nature of the digital objects are on offer? How are they used by the dominant devices? How can we repurpose them for social research? So I thought to myself, well, maybe we can think about um, um, doing, you know, inferring um, you know, political affiliation of uh, you know, television shows, which is not something that has um, never been done before. It has been done, uh, but here's a here's a new here's a new way of doing it. Uh, and, but it went farther than that because I mean we you know we did Christianity Islam uh, it's all sort of you know these are also kind of compatibility measures um, but at the same time they're be between things based on friends of yeah so um, so there's more work I mean this is just this is this is more fun but uh, but it it, it, it it again tries to demonstrate a proof of concept uh, so that's where the art based stuff comes in at least these, these two Yeah, thank you. Oh, 
I'm fascinated by the Wikipedia piece in particular, um, in part because I got a little obsessed years ago with looking at the American Revolution, um, which is an English Wikipedia entry that has to be resolved by American English and British English. And one of the things that's delightful about that uh, Wikipedia entry is, is actually discussion pages around it as to whether the revolutionaries were terrorists and other such interesting languages the British and the Americans tried to resolve history in one language. And in some ways, this is an interesting inversion of that, right? Which is that these were experiencing the same topic, but in some ways, you could split it out across the language. And I'm trying to think, you know, and this goes in some ways to Lance's point, are there ways that you can frame these kinds of cases in social science narratives that make sense? And one of the things I was sort of mucking about with my head was an idea of code switching. And code switching, of course, is a very local, interpersonal kinds of communication strategy. But what is the notion of community-wide code switching? And how do we understand some of this kind of element through a broader kind of collective action dynamic? And I wonder if there's just ways in which you can, I mean, I'm curious to sort of read your paper, and I realize you only gave a sort of sampling of this, but I'm wondering if there's ways of understanding this as something that happens right now, because this case, these people are still alive, versus the American Revolution, which no one's still alive. But yet, what are these different kinds of contested battles, because so much of it's rooted in identity? And that just might be one way to think of how to connect it around different social science narratives. So, um, the, the, the Shrevenitsa case is a, is a sort of special case because it's a, it's a disputed article. And apparently, you know, in Wikipedia, it, it has been said, it has been argued that disputed articles attract particular kind of editors. Um, and and um, we sort of conf we confirmed that finding. Um, it turns out that the that the top ten editors uh, from um, um, four so not the English one but the the, the, the Serbian the Bosnian the Serbian the Bosnian top ten editors nine of them have been banned from Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's how heavy it is, and that's how the uh, and and you see you see. Um, 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 how they're reacting to each other in the talk pages. So you see all the, endlessly these ideas. Um, so if you read the Bosnian talk page, um, which I mean, my, my uh, co-author um, uh, Amina is uh, Bosnian Dutch. If you read the talk pages, and I was reading them in Google Chrome, she was reading them. Reading them. Um, if you if if you read them, what they they talk about? Like, have you seen the the sort of the mess that's going on in the Serbian space? And then. And then the Serbians are reading uh, their, the Bosnian discussion, the Bosnian pages as well. So there is this, and but they leave, they try to sort of leave each other alone, but, but they monitor each other. Um, so there, there, there is some, I don't know, there, there is some understanding of each other's positions in some sense. Um, um, but, but whilst there is, um, the articles continue to grow farther and farther apart. So what I didn't mention is um, most of the articles, um, so the, 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 the Bosnian, the Serbian, the Croatian, and, and part of the Serbian Croatian originated from the English, the translations of the English. So they started the same. And then over the course of six years, they became more and more divergent. Uh, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, it's just a fun thing to think yeah. about, connecting it to some of the other cases. And then part of the some lenses I which is, I think, Sitting as a Wikipedia case is really important, but connecting it to broader discourses might be a way of actually doing some of that bridge work. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask a different question, but this just reminds me, since back in LA, um, you know, there's there's plenty of interesting, you know, critique of NPOV around the way it ends up replicating the structural biases that are present in the broader political economy of the media system because you can't do original research on Wikipedia, you have to cite uh, existing reputable established sources. So like in LA, the 2007 uh, MacArthur Park police riot, which was an attack on a peaceful group of uh, rights protesters, um, generated this huge sort of controversy on Wikipedia in the way that it was framed as uh, May Day Melee, which was the headline of the LA Times article. Four years later, of course, turns out the internal police commission finding found all the fault is on the side of LAPD. The protesters received an $11 million settlement, which is the largest in the history of Los Angeles. So all the things that were sort of claimed in the top pages by people who were actually present you know, in the space turn out to be true by, by the police commission's own report. But if you go to the Wikipedia entry, it's still going to just say Mayday Melee and has this whole thing about the you know, violent conflict between police and protesters because the people who tried to uh, insert the sort of ground truthing stuff didn't have citations in LA Times, so they get you know edited out later. 
but the question that I wanted to, to sort of float was more around, um, you know, I was making a strong argument yesterday for the need to do multi-methods research and thinking about how we link what's happening in online spaces with uh, sort of face-to-face -face activity and social movement networks. And one of the things about that is that, you know, we, it requires teams of people to do work. You know, none, none of us have all of these methodological skills, or very, very few of us are that kind of polygon. And this is something that's sort of much more widespread in other fields and hard sciences. What, what are your thoughts or your experience in the teams that you've sort of been working with? And how do, how do we more effectively do that work and make that more a part of our sort of general practice within the, 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 the academy? How do we work across methods and assemble multidisciplinary teams so that we have data scientists as well as ethnographers so that we can make more interesting and complicated arguments about, uh, you know, about the, well, for me, it's social network space, uh, social movement spaces, but it could be any domain, really. Yeah, so, uh so my, my own experience of the last 10, 15 years is, is um, uh, we, we work in, in, in uh, multidisciplinary teams of, of, um, of sort of like analysts, methodologists, programmers, and designers, uh, always. Um, and uh, it's because, it's because of the, the projects, have, you know, the, the outputs of you know, the academic work, maybe some artistic work, uh, software, graphics. Um, so there's, there's all of those, all those, uh, all those built in, um, and we try to, um, I mean, it, like sort of intercultural, <laughs> intercultural. So then talking about disciplinary cultures, communication is is a, is a must, and so so we work very very hard making sure that you know the designers can can do a bug report to a programmer that that that, that when a programmer says something to to a designer, the designer knows that it's not meant to be hurtful. Whatever. It's very like, so we're, we're working in these kind of in um, these cross disciplinary teams, but those disciplines. Um, so that so we um, uh, put a premium on, on this sort of you know this cross cultural this interdisciplinary communication skill. So this is the only lesson that I've learned. Is it? I mean, is this a way to get at, at your or their question around? I mean, how does how does that paradigm shift take place? And I think part of it is it has to be. Um, more systematic approaches to creating those kinds of teams and creating spaces where they can be validated within the academy and in the publication. I think the validation part is really important. I mean, probably everybody here is working with their disciplinary teams already and understands the necessity and the beauty of that. But getting that out there into the standard social science disciplines, I think, is a little bit of a tougher mission. Um, it's an important one. I think we are pretty much on the end of our time here, so let's give another round of applause.